Hi, everyone. We're just waiting for everyone to come in before we get started. Um, Leah, can you make sure that we've hit the recorded button? Yeah, you have. So we're we're getting uh, we're recording this. Just going to give it a couple more minutes for people to come into the room. So welcome everyone to the next edition of On the Park Bench. We're really excited about today's lineup. Um, On the Park Bench is a webinar series that we launched at the start of the pandemic to provide a platform for CNU members, partners, and allies to get together to discuss what are the emerging issues that we're facing during the pandemic? What are the emerging issues facing new urbanism? Um, what are the emerging issues facing placemaking? So we're really excited to, to have this, and we're really excited with the lineup that we have today to hear a little bit more about the work that CNU and AARP has been doing. What's most interesting that we're going to hear about today is how AARP, which is a major stakeholder in all of our work, got started in this. Um, before we begin, I wanted to plug the CNU's last virtual Congress, CNU 29, Design for Change. We dramatically dropped our registration rates this year um, because we want to really blow up, at, blow up the attendance and, and introduce new urbanism and the Congress to new partners. So please go ahead and register. Um, this is the deal of the year, five days of programming, all of your continuing education credits, um, rock bottom prices. And as we like to say, this is our last virtual Congress. We're really excited about that. Um, <clears throat> go ahead and register. We have at least two more webinars scheduled. Um, next week, we're going to hear from Mindy Thompson, Full of Love, and Kennedy Smith about Main Street and how a Sydney a city's heart connects us all. Um, Mindy was uh, an amazing keynoter for our very first Transportation and Equity Summit um, in 2014. So we are absolutely thrilled that she is coming back to CNU. And then on Tuesday, uh, March 23rd, we're gonna hear about the, the Columbus Downtown Development Corporation and Parks Proving Their Worth. This is an amazing project that has won a charter award. So. Um, feel free to go ahead and start the registration now. And of course, we'll be reminding you all as we move forward. Um, today, this is, this is our lineup of speakers and, and I'm just absolutely thrilled to uh, introduce my longtime friend and collaborator, Danielle Aragoni. Danielle and I have been working together since 2000, so that's 21 years. Um, she looks exactly the same, by the way. So Danielle is now the Director of the Livable Communities at AARP. And before that, she served in leadership positions um, at the US EPA and at HUD. She's an amazing, go-getter. Um, I try to learn as much as I can from Danielle on a regular basis. Um, Kelly Stoddard Poor is the Associate State Director at AARP, and she joined the Vermont team in 2013. She leads the livable community work for the state of Vermont, um, for AARP Vermont, and she establishes a, a vision and action step for Vermont communities to meet the needs of its aging population. And last but not least is Fred Buzo, who's the Associate State Director for AARP California. And Fred has been recognized by elected and community leaders as a consummate, highly respected professional with more than 25 years professional service and a leader who has worked closely with elected officials and government and community service agency to help accomplish their goals. As kind of by way of background, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the joint document that we've just finished completing with AARP. We're, we're kind of at the end of a two-year effort. It, it, was, it was a labor of love. Um, but we worked together, AARP and CNU, to create this Enabling Better Places, a handbook for improved communities, improved neighborhoods. And this work comes out of the work that CNU and the state of Michigan did on our neighborhood neighborhood centers and adjacent corridors, our, our urban work in, in air in Michigan. Um, those documents are available on our website. 
But with AARP, we wanted to take a, a broader national view and how could what we learned in Michigan be applied to all communities. And so we really dove into looking at the reinventing spaces, how small changes can make a big difference and diving into the physical elements of space. And what are the small changes, the coding changes that we can make, that communities can make across the country that can make a big difference. We really looked at adapting for the greatest impact of how, what are the small changes we can make to our streetscapes, to building forms and uses, facades, frontages and parking included and integrated throughout all of the work in the document is really recognizing the role that our codes and ordinances have played in creating kind of structural racism. And so particularly in this document, we highlighted those areas that need to change in our codes to create more equitable and inclusive communities. So in that, um, in the document, more so than in the Michigan document, we looked at areas to for building support, identifying the key players and identifying the right reforms. Nobody wants to see a document that is just sitting there or is available. So with this document, we really tried to move through a process that helps communities engage um, with the right players uh, to move from ideas in a book to implementation. So if you're more interested, that's all I'm going to say about the document, you can find it on our website or you can find it on AARP's website. On AARP's website, for, you'll find a whole bunch of oodles of other tools for livable communities. And I'll go ahead and, and drop these um, links in, in the chat right now for everybody. But with that, I don't want to talk anymore. I want to turn it over to Danielle to have her tell a little bit more of the story of how AARP, which is a national stakeholder, got engaged in livable communities. So, Danielle? Thanks so much, Lynn, and uh, thanks for that incredibly warm and generous introduction. Um, we're really happy to be here with you all today. Uh, we recognize that Congressman Urbanism is the place where uh, local leaders in community design and building and uh, development live and reside and aggregate, congregate here on the park bench. So really happy to be a part of that conversation today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen as well. Um, and in the course of doing that, I do want to kind of touch base quickly on, on the roots here. So we, we certainly have a demographic charge um, to, to think about why we need to be playing a bigger role as AARP in communities, but there's also kind of a cultural uh, locus as well or origin as well. I, I don't have a slide on this, but our founder, uh, Dr. Ethel Percy Andrus, who formed AARP more than 60 years ago, actually was compelled to first organize retired teachers as it began in California. She had been a teacher um, big, when she recognized that one of her former colleagues was living in a chicken coop. Um, and that was because she was, her former colleague was unable to afford um, adequate housing in, in the course of her daily life. And that really set off um, what is, uh, what has been an incredible um, sort of avalanche of um, advocacy and organization that Dr. Andrus began um, on behalf of retired persons. Now we are just ARP. We, we work on behalf of all uh, older adults, 50 plus, and really we're working to create communities that benefit people of all ages. So that origin of, of Dr. Andrus's um, first identification of, of housing and community as such an incredible need um, really has blossomed into this very robust program that I'm really privileged to um, contribute to and, and to speak to with my colleagues here from Vermont and California. So I mentioned our sort of origin story. We also have this incredible demographic drive um, to work in this space, um, largely driven by this statistic, which I, I repeat ad nauseum because to me it is the reason that local leaders need to change the way they're doing things. We're very quickly approaching a day, uh, 2034 actually, is the day in which we will for the first time ever be comprised as a country of people more than older than 65, uh, more so than people under 18. So we are shifting from a, a predominantly younger crowd uh, demographic um, nation to a nation wherein the largest age group is, is, is 65 plus, certainly larger than, than 18, 18 below. Um, we're in the middle of, a, of an upswing and the growth of 65 plus. Um, in the last decade, we've seen that the, the number of 65 plus have 
uh, grown by more than a third just in the last decade alone. And I guarantee you, if you were to dig into these statistics in your communities or your states, you'll find something very similar. A number of states are already at that point where there are more people over 65 than there are under 18 uh, for the first point ever, or find that they are gonna approach that date very, very soon. So this really is kind of a national um, demographic trend that we're in the middle of. And it causes us to ask the question, causes me to ask the question, are we ready for that? Are we ready for that day? Um, and I think it's fair to say that when you look at the figures, when you look at the statistics and how communities are working for people, uh, particularly 65 and above, it's easy to conclude that we're not ready, that we're not building the kind of communities that are gonna be well suited um, to that demographic future. Certainly we see that in housing, where we see a huge mismatch between the type of housing that uh, we conventionally find in communities where 85% of our housing stock is two, three, four or more bedrooms, and yet, half of our households are one or two person households. Uh, we see that the rent increase, the rent burden on older adults um, is increasing. Uh, and that is of course uh, in its most extreme situations leading to increases in homelessness among older adults as well when that housing cost burden becomes too, too intense. We know that the housing stock does not adequately provide for accessibility features. There's a real shortage in homes that have basic features such as zero step entries or wider doorways. Um, when you think about parks and public spaces, we know that older adults are not um, finding in parks the kind of amenities and services and uh, features that they would like. And that's evident in the fact that older adults don't use parks um, to the same degree that they represent of the population. Moreover, we know that parks are not serving all people equally. They certainly are not serving communities of color in the same way that they serve non uh, or more white communities. Um, and communities of color parks are smaller, they're more uh, crowded. And um, particularly in places where there's a real lack of green space, we know that that can contribute to, um, to environmental conditions that have a very deleterious effect um, for older adults, particularly in, in case of, of, of heat waves. When you think about transportation and mobility, similarly, um, it, the built environment is not particularly well suited to the needs of older adults in which um, older adults typically outlive their ability to drive from anywhere from seven to 10 years. And when that day comes that they don't drive or choose not to drive, um, oftentimes there are very few options available. Uh, we know that our transit systems are, are, we're already suffering, now they're truly in crisis. Uh, we know that bike and ped fatalities are on the rise and that older adults uh, represent a disproportionate share of those in, in most states. Um, all of the, and many other factors, there's a lot of other sort of concerns about transportation that, that, that are now um, in the mix because of COVID-19. All of those conditions uh, really roll up to the fact that um, we, uh, we, we end up in situations where people are more isolated, where they are more lonely, and that that sense of prolonged isolation and loneliness contributes to very real health effects. Um, it's equivalent actually to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. And we know that it has uh, it contributes to an increased rate of dementia. All of these are good reasons to um, really think differently about how we're building communities. And that's where we at ARP um, want to play a role where we want to be supportive. We, our goal is to support communities and local leaders like you all to think differently about your housing, your transportation, your public spaces and more so that we are creating places that work for people of all ages. We do that in a few different ways that I'll try to walk through very quickly so we have ample time for, for my colleagues here. Um, the first of which is, is a framework for looking at uh, communities. Um, this is called our ARP Network of Age-Friendly States and Communities. It is a voluntary framework wherein localities or state governments can raise their hand and commit to a five-year process to become more age-friendly by mapping through what we call the eight domains of livability. Um, that begins with housing and transportation and public space, but extends to other things such as community health, employment and volunteerism, um, even how older adults are getting their information, which we know is critically important these days uh, as people are looking for clear, clear information on vaccine, um, just as one example. Uh, this process is very much rooted in listening to the needs of older adults and building diverse coalitions that can come together to align um, around common interests, such as improving the diversity of housing, improving um, the safety of pedestrians and cyclists, improving park space that really benefits all. So I encourage you to learn more about that. You can see if your community is in fact a member, and if not, maybe explore if that would be a value. 
Um, a second way in which we, or I, I apologize, one additional uh, comment here on the age-friendly communities. What we have seen about our age-friendly communities is that they've been very responsive to the challenges that have come before us in the last year. Um, equity has been a challenge always, but it really has sort of surged in, I think, awareness and prominence, justifiably. Um, and we've seen our age-friendly communities in particular really put equity at the center of their work and put in place some very clear steps and actions, whether that means targeting their efforts into communities that are um, underserved uh, as borne out by the data, or whether that means being intentional in making information and public um, engagement opportunities available in multiple languages, in multiple forums, um, partnering with, with trusted uh, entities that represent diverse um, members of the community. Um, similarly, in COVID, we've seen that since day one, our age friendly communities have been able to pivot their work to ensure that older adults are getting what they need, um, both in terms of um, immediate needs in the response mode, but now thinking about how we recover from uh, COVID-19, what is it that older adults are going to be need to, to be doing differently. So I encourage you to learn more about all of those. Um, a second way in which we support communities is through funding. Um, Lynn mentioned at the top that we have some money available. We actually do. Um, we're in the middle of our application window for our Community Challenge Grant Program. And this is a, a uh, once a year opportunity. We're now in our year five um, in which we fund quick action projects that we, really, that we hope are helping communities to demonstrate something new and innovative. So our goal here is to, to be that sort of catalytic investor to help you make the case for why things need to change in a community in pursuit of longer term change. That can mean things like colorful crosswalks to make the case to your local DOT or uh, public works department about why there's value in slowing traffic and encouraging pedestrian activity. It can mean things like colorful bike racks um, or things like public art or events like Ciclovia events, uh, slow streets events or education um, around how to use transit or how to use um, bicycles. Uh, once again, it can be making the case through um, construction of temporary bike lanes as to why uh, a more permanent solution would be appropriate for that community. Uh, it can also mean activities that bring older adults to the table in terms of planning for their communities, real community outreach and engagement opportunities, um, such as the kind we see here that happen to be in, in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, lots of really creative projects have come through this program in the last four years. We've funded um, more than $6 million worth of them, almost about 600 grants total in every state in the union, um, plus DC, Puerto Rico and Virgin Islands, and really encourage uh, creative solutions to come in again. Um, the deadline for that is April 14th. So please do put your thinking caps on about that and, um, and consider applying. A couple other tools um, that we offer, our livability index is, is a uh, mechanism in place where you can search by address, by, uh, by zip code, by community to find out how your community is doing at present. Um, it's a data-driven index that combines about 60 different um, policies and metrics to articulate what are the strengths in a community and what are some areas that they need to work on. Um, we also have a, a searchable map where you can find out whether your community is an age-friendly community or what other places like you uh, might be uh, in terms of population size or, or ge geography. Um, it also lets you search past community grant locations and projects. Um, finally, we also have a really robust website and which I'd encourage you to check out, uh, but also in particular, we have a weekly newsletter that comes out just about every Wednesday Super easy to sign up, just text livable to 50757. And uh, this is a practitioner focused newsletter that is your best way to learn about new resources, new grant opportunities and the like. Um, goes to about 110,000 practitioners now, local leaders around the country, highly encourage you to sign up. One of the things that I'm most proud of uh, that ARP does is, is offer a robust library of resources, free publications, um, to local leaders. Oftentimes, these are ways to articulate the value of an approach, um, both for people on the ground, but also to help local leaders take action. Um, so we have publications on, on everything from housing to, to parks to transportation. A few that I'll call out for you here. Uh, we have some great resources on ADUs. In particular, I want to um, flag that um, in addition to our guide, the ABCs of ADUs that you'll see here, which really makes the case for why ADUs fit in communities and can benefit older adults. Um, I'm proud to say that we also just last month released a new model and state local ADU code. Um, we had had one uh, in place for about 20 years. We just updated that um, and we're happy to re-release that. So that's available as well. You can find out more at ARP.org slash ADUs. 
Um, but we also have other publications available, such as things on placemaking, pop-up demonstrations, um, on how to evaluate parks to see whether they're um, sufficiently intergenerational or how they could be improved. Um, several publications related to housing um, in terms of making the case for more diverse housing stock and much more. And of course, as Lynn mentioned, uh, one of the things that we're proud of very much so is, is this new handbook that we've been able to do with CNU. Um, I think one of the things that this does so well is it makes the case for all of the sort of interstitial codes and regulations that create a community. It, we, it's not enough to just fix the housing in isolation or to just fix the streetscape in, in, in isolation. It's all those factors coming together and particularly the intersection between those points um, that come together in the forms of facades and building design and, and uses of, of, of public spaces that really make a community livable and walkable and dynamic and inclusive or not. Um, and so this guide uh, is, is, a, is a guidebook to help you in identifying um, codes that can be brought to bear that are relatively um, small scale in nature, but big in impact. Um, and there's a, there's a little bit of an easier link here to, to find the document than the one Lynn shared. Um, easy to remember, ARP.org slash zoning. So um, please do check it out. And again, we're happy to make those um, publications available to you for free in print upon request. Couple quick examples of how this works, and then I'm gonna turn it over to my colleagues to tell you more about uh, how they're seeing it unfold in their communities. So in Des Moines, Iowa, for example, um, Des Moines, Iowa has been a member of our H Family Network for several years. Early on in their work, they identified a need for more compact, walkable communities with housing that's affordable to, more, that's more affordable than the typical single family home would be. Um, as a result of that, they've been able to apply for several community, um, several activities, one of which is a community challenge grant to um, fund the construction of a model ADU and really make the case for why diverse housing stock is needed. Um, they've identified areas of underinvestment um, with a focus on 50 plus residents and helped to drive funding into those corridors as a result. And they've looked at businesses and how businesses in their community can um, can better serve the needs of older adults. So uh, more information there, I'll, there's the link which we'll make available after the, um, the presentation. Another one, uh, Miami-Dade County, again, a member of our H friendly network for several years, as well as several jurisdictions within the county. They're focusing on, among other things, transportation and how can they improve pedestrian safety um, on, on some of their more busy and dangerous roadways. Uh, they are advocating for additional transit stops and improved quality of transit stops as evidenced by um, a grant publication, a grant that they received to install these age-friendly benches at transit stops. They know that for older adults, standing in the heat waiting for a bus is not a solution. That's not going to work. Um, and so by providing uh, benches for people to rest, again, doesn't just help older adults, um, they can improve the quality of the transit experience for, for those residents. Finally, Columbus, Ohio, another great age-friendly leader, been a member for several years now. Um, looking into transportation specifically, they've been able to achieve some really fantastic work in the last several years, one of which was a safe routes to age in place study with their Ohio DOT. Um, another one is this Lifting Villages program, which connects existing villages, which are membership-based, uh, neighborhood-based um, organizations that help people age in place with Lyft. So that when, when a volunteer driver is not available through their village, uh, a Lyft driver can be made available. And that Lyft driver has already been educated, trained on what the needs of older adults are. And moreover, um, older adults who don't have smartphones can still access uh, a Lyft driver, which has been a, a breakdown um, for many older adults. So uh, lots of good stories here to peruse. Again, I wanna turn it over to my colleagues now, um, Fred and Kelly, and I think we're starting up with Fred who will tell the story of uh, what's going, good stuff that's happening in ARP California. So Fred. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Fred Buzo. I'm an Associate State Director from uh, uh, AARP California. I'm based in San Jose. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna share an experience that uh, we had uh, that started several years ago and that we're still going through actually uh, an ex example of zoning reform. So let me share my screen and then uh, we'll get right to it. Let me know when you're able to see that. Yep, it's here. It's here, Fred. There you go. That's perfect. Okay, great. So, 
so AARP policy on land use. This is this is straight from our policy book at AARP. So um, you know, we, we think that you have to have proper uh, land use planning uh, in order to develop communities, uh, you know, livable communities and age friendly cities, which is what the program that uh, Danielle spoke of. Um, so that that is our foundation. That is our basis, really, for the for the work that that we're doing uh, in regards to a building out and, and working with local governments to build out these livable communities and age friendly cities. So then back in 2017. Um, which is when uh, we started to ask ourselves, well, how can we do this, right? How can we convince cities or work with cities to build out these, these uh, age-friendly communities? And so one thing is we, we, we figured out that we needed to embed our, these our age-friendly policies within an urban planning agenda. So specifically within the urban planning agenda of a city. And um, how do we do that? Well, we have to partner with organizations outside of our aging network, meaning we have to stop talking to ourselves and stop talking to organizations like AARP who are only working on uh, older adult issues. So we had to talk to planners, planning departments, architects, developers. Uh, we also had to narrow the focus of the work. We could not be all things to all people in order to affect zoning reform that was going to uh, Im be impactful. So we had to take advantage of what we call strategic opportunities uh, in order to begin this work. So a strategic opportunity, 2017. Um, the mayor of San Jose wrote a memo where he, he talks about reimagining underutilized business corridors. And he provides specific examples of the business corridors within the city of San Jose that he would like to see reimagined. And uh, you'll see that the, the, one of the highlight or the highlighted location in San Jose or of one of the business corridors is 13th Street slash Luna Park. Well, in my prior work for the city of San Jose, I was very familiar with this area. I knew the community. So I knew what it was going to take in order to get the buy-in of the community. So taking advantage of this memo that the mayor wrote and then my relationships with the community, I thought, well, let's let's make this the focus of our work in regards to uh, zoning reform. Um, and then the other thing too was that by by using the mayor's memo as the foundation for our work, when you go to the community, you can then say, hey, we did not choose this location, right? Because sometimes when you go out to the community, they're gonna ask you that. Well, who are you? How did ARP choose North 13th Street? Well, we didn't choose North 13th Street. The mayor wrote it in his memo. This was adopted by the city council. So it wasn't, it wasn't us going into a community telling them, oh, this is what needs to be done. This, this was already happening and they just needed to be made, made aware of it and feel you know, as if they, they were working with us in order to, to, uh, to do the best work possible here. So what did we decide to do? Well, I went out on a roadshow basically in the city of San Jose <laughs> and I went to neighborhood meetings, I went to senior commission meetings, uh, business association meetings, nonprofit board meetings. And so the idea was that we were going to convene we didn't know if it was going to be a charrette or if it was going to be just a series of design workshops, but we, we landed on a charrette. And so, but prior to the charrette, I had to go out to the community and talk to them about it because one, no one knew what a charrette was, right? They were like, charrette, what are you talking about? You know, what is that? And so I had to go out and explain, you know, sort of what a, a charrette entailed and why, again, we were focusing on North 13th Street again, pointing to the mayor's memo and saying, hey, look, this is happening already with or without uh, our input. Wouldn't, don't you wanna have input into this process? Well, of course, the neighbor, communities wanna have input. So uh, I wanted to give them a voice and work with them, uh, with the city in order to, uh, to get this work done. So we convened a charrette in 2018, one week, April 30th through May 5th, we brought in folks from uh, CNU, actually, uh, people like Scott Ball, like Matthew Lambert, Ellen Dunham Jones. And uh, we were there for a week. Danielle participated as well. And so it was great. It was a great event. Uh, we had 
uh, for folks from the community come in. We had city planners involved. We had people from the, the Valley Transit uh, Authority, who is our, our, our local transit agency within the county. Uh, San Jose State students who uh, from their urban planning department. So it was it was great. I mean, it was a great experience. Uh, some great work was done, and we landed on uh, a few re recommendations in regards to North 13th Street. So this is at the time of the charrette. Well, even currently, this is still the current zoning de uh, designation within the general plan of San Jose for North 13th Street. So mixed use commercial. So it's funny when you go out to the community and the neighborhood and you talk to them about, hey, you know, this is what's in the general plan. <laughs> they have no idea what's in the general plan, right? <laughs> and so you talk to them about, hey, these are the allowable uses within your business corridor right now. And you start talking about mid-rise office and they're like, what are you talking about? Really? Because if you go out to North 13th Street right now, it is. It is like semi, you know, post-apocalyptic. I mean, it is in terrible shape. Very few new construction has taken place over the past, you know, 40 years. And the one thing that has been built is like a one-story auto zone with like a huge parking lot, you know. So though that you could point to that and say, this is what your current uh, land use designation within the general plan will get you, is a bunch of one-story auto zones with parking lots. People don't want that. And, and I knew that, you know, because I'd worked with that community before. So I went out, talked to them about their current land use designation. But then this is what we recommended. So we, re we recommended you go from your mixed use commercial to your mixed use neighborhood. And the reason was really, if you looked at how the neighborhood and how this business quarter had been, had been built historically, there was already a ton of housing there. There were, there was residential over retail that had been built like in the 1900s. There were single family homes, there were triplexes, there were duplexes. And yet the city was saying that they did not want to allow any residential development on that business corridor. So it was like, okay, so you're not going to allow any new, new residential development, but yet 50% of the lots, or almost 50% of the lots on this business, business corridor had residential uses on them already. So it just didn't make any sense to say, hey, we are just going to create an entire, you know, just an entire uh, commercial corridor and just get rid of all the residential. So the mixed use neighborhood uh, designation fit the, uh, um, you know, just the historic uh, uh, development of the uh, North 13th Street commercial corridor. So we make the recommendation. These are the types of renderings that were drawn at the charrette to show people, look, these are the kinds of things you could have on your corridor if zoning is, is reformed, if zoning is, is modified. Now, of course, people loved it. I mean, look at them. It looks great, right? And so even, even when you got to the, you know, to the, uh, um, you know, to the, to the renderings that had, you know, four stories, or so, people were okay with that because you could tell them, look, this is not going to be right next to you know, a, a, a single family home. This is the way North 13th Street works. It, it gets more dense as you, as you move further uh, west. And so people, people were fine with it. You know? they, they really loved it. And so we got the buy-in of the community. So now we're in 2018. The mayor submits another memo and says, yes, you need to work with AARP on neighborhood business districts like North 13th Street, again, emphasizing to the planning department, you got to do this. So let's work. Let's, let's keep moving forward. 2018. Another year goes by, right? But you got to imagine, look, between 2018 and 2019, I'm still going out to the community. I'm still going out to events and parks and showing people copies of the Charette report and saying, hey, you know, this is still going. Let's still do this. 2019, uh, planning staff, submits their memo on the scope of the general plan update. Thank goodness, we're gonna have a general plan update. Residential uses in underutilized business corridors to allow the integration of housing. It's in there. We were like, yes, we got this, right? We got it in the scope of the general plan update. Now we gotta go through the general plan update. February 27th of 2020, the general plan task force recommends uh, that, um, that there be essentially, you know, zoning reform to res to allow residential uses in places like 
And it lists some other areas in San Jose, but North 13th Street is on there. And so at this point in time, what we have is this recommendation by the general plan, uh, general plan task force that provides recommendations to the city council. All of this was supposed to be done last year, but because of COVID things were delayed. And so now we, it is scheduled to be heard at the city council in June of 2021. Uh, so in a few months. So what I'm hoping is that, you know, we can, I can come back and report that it was adopted and that this zoning reform is going to take place officially. But it's, it's as you know, it's long-term work. Um, it takes, uh, uh, you know, it takes many people. It takes great urban planners, great architects, but it takes a political champion. And we've had the support of the mayor and the city council member here. And it takes people on the ground in the neighborhood and advocates and partner organizations to get it all done. So uh, hopefully it will be done, um, but you know, cities move really slowly as you know, and um, sometimes you have to force them to move a little bit or nudge them as we'd like to say to ARP, right, Danielle? <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, that that's all I have. Um, I didn't put a link to the Charette report on here. I should have, I can put it in the chat though. And so that way, you can uh, download that on your own. Thank you. And now I'll turn it over to Kelly. Thank uh, you, Vermont. Fred. Thank you, Fred. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Kelly stoddard poor with AARP Vermont State Office. And I'm going to just, if you give me one second, I'm just going to pull up my Okay, pull up my slides here. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you to CNU for hosting this great um, webinar and for inviting us to be able to participate and share a little bit about from the work that we've been doing in up in the northeast corner. Um, I'm going to talk about our partnerships and the work that has gone into updating Vermont's zoning and land use regulations with the ultimate goal of creating more walkable age friendly. Like many states, Vermont has many communities with outdated zoning that adds to our um, housing affordability problems here in Vermont. Over the course of the last two years, AARP Vermont partnered up with our Department of Housing and Community Development, the Vermont Association of Realtors, and the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board to leverage the national expertise of CNU to come to Vermont to help us tackle our zoning problems. Through the Project for Code Reform, we worked together to create a guide for small rural communities. Zoning for Great Neighborhoods aims to help communities in Vermont um, address that mismatch between the housing that is actually available on the market and the type of housing that we need in our communities. We need to be able to update our local land use regulations to be able to provide more housing choices for more Vermonters. And CNU came and helped us out doing that. So first I wanna just share a little a little bit about the challenges and opportunities that Vermont faces. Like the rest of the country, we, we are faced with housing affordability um, issues as well in every county in Vermont. So it touches all corners of our state. At least one out of every eight households spends more than half of their income on housing. It's tremendous. We are also saddled with a very old housing stock. The majority of our housing has been built for able-bodied 35-year-olds. In fact, one in four houses in Vermont was built before 1940. That's twice the national rate. We also have a population that isn't growing, but our households are. The household size is shared earlier. Almost 70% of Vermont households have fewer than two people. And a quarter of our, of our households have single persons. They're just one person, which represents half the total number of one bedroom units that we even have available in our state. So as a result, many of our housing markets, we have you know, pockets, our bigger cities like our Burlington and our Montpelier, uh, Brattleboro, Bennington, and these are, you know, our biggest city in Vermont is just 45,000. So everything's relative here. Um, they struggle with being able to add more housing to the market itself. But the majority of um, 
communities in Vermont are really struggling with how to be able, how do you improve the quality and the accessibility of the homes that exist on the market now? So many, many people in Vermont take two sort of narratives that, um, when we think about our future and the planning of our future. We look, some people will say, we need to grow our recreational economy. We need to attract more millennials to Vermont. And then others will talk about the aging of our population and that we're not prepared for our aging population. And both narratives are really to focus on both. But right now, Vermont really isn't ready for success when we look at just our housing market. But what we do know, and the positive side, is that people want livable, walkable communities um, and, and millennials alike. There's growing desire to live jobs and services among all age groups. People offer a long commute for a smaller home. And the last, from the, according to the National Association of Realtors, the top three factors for influencing neighborhood choice um, for 2018 home buyers. One was convenience to job, two, home affordability, and three, the quality of neighborhood. So creating new units in Vermont is really hard. Updating regulations is difficult. Um, many of our communities are small and we have a lot of municipalities that are under-resourced. Um, but the fundamental decisions really are happening on that very local level in Vermont. And we recognized along with our partners that municipalities need help. We need to address regulatory barriers like cost and delay from our lengthy appeals process through the development review board process in towns, the complexity of state and local uh, permitting processes and parking minimums. So enabling better places, a zoning guide for great neighborhoods, which um, I'm just gonna hold up really quick. Um, this is the one that is really, that CNU helped us build um, and create and this guidance really provides this model regulation to help support incremental process, incremental zoning reform um, that is really focused on being able to provide a wide variety of housing choices. Uh, this work was also done in collaboration with our regional planning commissions. We were able to select six communities in Vermont to serve as case studies, allowing us to focus on the practicality of how to zone for multi-unit or other flexible housing types. First, we tackled the types of regulatory barriers that were preventing homes from being built in Vermont, from the village level, neighborhood level, and downtowns as well. And then uh, we analyzed the local regulations as well. And then finally, finding um, regulations that would support the types of housing that we need in our communities. And one of the best things we learned from CNU, if you do nothing else, do this. The, the biggest, smallest, um, the biggest, littlest change you can make in your community. And I think that this is really important, particularly for small communities where they could feel really overwhelmed with taking everything on around zoning reform. And this incremental approach is it. it it is so important because it allows people to be able to take these small taking small adjustments to um, zoning reform and to be able to continue to, be able to achieve these age-friendly walkable communities that everybody wants. So in you, we tackle dimensional standards, parking standards, allowable uses, street standards, the opportunity around ADUs, and uh, our development review board process here in Vermont. So I'm going to talk really briefly about how we were able to apply this great work that CNU uh, brought to us here in Vermont and bringing all of our partners together as well and looking at the opportunity around accessory dwelling units. Uh, um, so back in 2019, um, the AARP Vermont State Office surveyed the 45 plus in Vermont. We asked in number of questions on ADUs and it was really refreshing to get such strong support for from, from small rural communities, our larger um, cities here in Vermont around the support for um, ADU ordinances. Um, so this, this helped lead our work um, specifically in Burlington, uh, working with the mayor's office in Burlington, along with a couple of our partners from the business community and Home Share Vermont to be able to update the local ordinance in Burlington to make 
enable more ADUs to be able to be built. There was just a strong desire for people to be able to build them. And they, they were encountering a number of significant barriers that prevented them uh, from building um, the parking, the parking uh, minimum was a big one. So what we were able to accomplish in Burlington, uh, um, we were able to allow ADUs as an accessory to all single family residential structures in any zoning district in the city of Burlington. We we're able to streamline the permitting process, uh, which tended to be very time consuming and costly for homeowners. Um, and if, you, if the ADU met um, all of the uh, um, applicable requirements, um, they were then permitted by right um, without the requirement of going through the development review board process in, um, in Burlington. Also eliminated the parking requirement. So they were no longer required to have um, a parking space for the ADU. And if they were to provide a parking space, there was more flexibility of how you could accommodate that on the lot. Remember, there's a, we do have this really old housing stock, and so a lot of uh, driveways are long and narrow, and previously they weren't allowed to be able to, to do the stacked parking. Um, and then we simplified and increased the max ADU size as well, which really helped a lot of the smaller homes on larger lots to be on ADUs because it was previously capped. Um, at 20% um, of habitable space. And then um, providing lot exemption coverage, um, provided a lot coverage exemption use footprint to be exempt from the lot coverage minimums um, uh, when storm water was managed properly. We did keep the owner occupancy in place. That was part of our state statute. Um, and that, that one, um, Provided some great conversation, community conversation, but in in the end, the community really wanted to keep um, that piece in the ordinance. And then some of the non-regulatory efforts that we um, have done is providing, we worked with HomeShare Vermont to provide a how-to guide for homeowners living in Burlington to help them walk them through step-by-step -step, um, through the construction of an ADU and the permitting process. Um, and there's also technical assistance available as well for homeowners in Burlington. And then we work um, with HomeShare and the city as well to provide, um, say, uh, maybe every four months we do a webinar um, um, okay, um, homeowners of how to build ADUs in the city of Burlington. So we're really excited to see all the traction that ADUs is getting, not just in Burlington, but in a lot of our other smaller communities as well. So, and that will conclude my presentation. So I'm going to turn it back to Lynn. Thank you so much. Thanks, Kelly, Danielle, and Fred. Really have appreciated hearing the backstory of how AARP nationally is supporting hundreds of communities with millions of dollars to demonstrate um, small changes in your community, how you all are engaging at a big city like San Jose all the way over to small or rural of Vermont. That's, that's, quite a, that's, that's quite a scope. Um, increasingly, we've been finding at CNU what an incredible stakeholder AARP has been both at the national and at the state office for all of the work that we're doing. And I can only imagine for all of CNU members having AARP as a partner in their projects could be equally as beneficial. So, Danielle, I'm going to throw the first question to you mm -hmm. and to ask how can, if, if a CNU member is doing some project in some state, how can they bring AARP to the table to help, you know, move the conversation forward? Um, yeah, no, that's a great question. And I think that's exactly what we hope that flows out of this, uh, our being here today. I mean, I, I've got a slide that shows a couple different ways in which you can get involved. Um, the short of it is to um, figure out where, which ARP uh, state office is available in your in your state. So all of our state offices, I will say California and Vermont are among our more um, deeply steeped in this work, but there are 49 other states around, uh, sorry, 40, 51 other states around the country that um, are working in this, in this space as well, including DC, Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands. Um, but a few things that people can do. One, certainly apply for a community challenge grant. Um, the reason that's important is because state offices are the first layer of review for those grant applications. And ultimately that is how we are learning. Our state offices find new and great partners around the state. Um, so 
craft an idea, work with your municipality, work with the nonprofit, send that up. That's a great way to begin to make the, uh, be, get on the radar screen of your ARP state office. So that's one way. It also has the potential of, of realizing some very real um, investment uh, in the project as well. Um, two, check out our map, the, the interactive map here to see what's happening in your community <clears throat> already. So again, the map that we've listed here includes our age-friendly communities and our former challenge grant recipients. So that's another great way of finding out where ARP is showing up in your community already, learning a little bit about what's been done and perhaps how to build on that prior work. Um, another way is, of course, sign up for our newsletter. That's a great way to find out what's happening um, in our world. It's easy to do that uh, by texting livable uh, to 50757. I think one of the best ways you can get involved is just perusing our website and certainly making good use of our publications. You know, all our talk about ADUs and there's a question I think in the queue about how, you know, combating NIMBYism. You know, a lot of the reason that we put together these publications is to, is to put material in the hands of local practitioners and advocates to make the case for why these topics matter to older adults. So when we're talking about ADUs, we're talking about how they expressly meet the needs of older adults based on some research data that we've conducted. Um, wherein we know that, you know, of, of the homeowners who don't currently have an ADU, a third of them would like to build one. And why do they want to build one? They want to build one for income, for help, or for have, for companionship. Um, so we, we make the case for that in, in our ADU guide, as well as many of our other guides. Um, and that can be a real tool and a resource to you in your local work. And then finally, of course, uh, as I mentioned, look up the ARP state office in your state. Again, real easy, arp.org slash states. Um, and that will connect you with uh, your local team. Um, Danielle, as a small little follow follow on, but you said something just now that I want you to amplify. So in the work that we're that we're doing collaboratively with AARP, um, I've mentioned a couple of times the big issue, Danielle, that we're facing is about NIMBYism and advocacy. Do you want us to put any in, any information on that? And Danielle's answer is, I, I'm I'm answering for you, but you're going to tee up. She was like, Oh no. We got this. We wrote the book on advocacy. Um, and I think that that's really important. So many of our members are in meetings where the NIMBYs are coming out. And you're saying you can bring an entire huge organization to say, no, we want this. So can you talk a little bit more about the, and both, you know, Fred and Kelly as well, the, the, the advocacy that you all bring and the, the loud voice of yes in my backyard. Yeah, no, I think I, I don't want to overcommit our states to that <laughs> position. And I will say we have a, a policy book that we follow, but our policy book is very uh, inclusive of all the issues that we talk about here. So each state director ultimately makes the decisions for their own advocacy priorities. So I'll let Kelly and Fred speak to that um, from the state perspective. But I will say in general, we one of the other amazing tools that we have is incredible volunteers. So we really do between our print publications and between our our, our, our muscle memory on how to do advocacy and with our incredible volunteers, we are able to mobilize people and make the case that um, there is a different perspective to be considered. And when you think about uh, comprehensive zoning or when you think about increasing missing middle housing or when you think about bike and pet safety, it's critical that you hear from older adults on that topic because these matters directly pertain to older adults and, and older adults are, can be very vocal in their wishes. And so our goal is to really position older adults as a partner and part of the solution rather than just uh, as opposition. But Kelly, maybe you want to mention a little bit about the advocacy work that happened around the Burlington um, ADU. Yeah, I would be happy to. Thanks, Daniela. Um, I, I think what is so important, I think that what AARP is able to bring to the table is really the focus on community engagement and working with the community where they're at and bringing them along um, and hearing from the community. So we, we, we led a number of community, community workshops leading up to our work around uh, the ordinance on, in Burlington. And we, we held you know, a couple two day like workshop styles um, where we just invited homeowners to come out and talked about the possibility around ADUs um, and really focusing on the the opportunity that ADUs provide to be able to age in place. Um, and, and also that they're an affordable option as well for folks. Um, 
And then we did a lot of coffee hours as well um, in neighborhoods, just setting up a number of coffee hours for people to come and chat with us, um, working, as Danielle said too, with our volunteers to help them as well lead some of these coffee hours. And just really listening to the community is really important. People want to be heard um, and giving them a chance to be able to be heard and to work with them um, along the process is great. This, this is about housing. And I just want to make a quick plug because it's one of my favorite tools from ARP is our walk audit. And that is also a wonderful community engagement tool is to be able to bring community members out on a walk audit and be able to see see and experience that walk through their through their through their through their lens, um, and to be able to make recommendations um, from the walk on it is another wonderful way. If you want to tackle so, streets, speeding, and things like that, so Kelly, you're cutting in and out just just oh. as an, just as an FYI, um, Danielle has a hard stop at about about 105 and there's one other question that I want to send um, Danielle's way um, which is has AP, AARP modeled any state enabling legislation that addresses livability issues including transportation walk walkability zoning etc um, yeah on this specifically I do want to draw people's attention to the to the model state ADU code I mean I think that's possibly the the biggest um, thing that we've been able to offer in this space recently um, again, we know that it's a model code, right? It's going to take some adjustment at the state level. Um, but that the fact that we've articulated a model state code as well as a model local ADU code, I think can go a long way. We hope it goes a long way to making it easier to put in place the right kind of regulations. Um, I want to send a message out to Jim Jones. You asked a question about ADUs, and I want to make sure that you feel that um, that has been that has been answered. If not, send, send me a text. Um, Bruce Caps asks, uh, for those who have experience with ADUs, what is the average cost of construction per square foot? Do you have any experience on that? You give me a second, I can look it up. <laughs> all right, all right. Then, then we'll do move to a question for, for Kelly. Can you talk a little bit about the role of ADUs as a tool for addressing affordability, particularly in rural communities? I know that that was a really big issue that we addressed, just not in Burlington, but Burlington is the outlier for Vermont. So how talk a little bit about the uh, ADUs and affordability in Vermont. Okay, hopefully I don't cut out. Am I cutting out again, Lynn? You're good. I'm good. Okay, sorry. Internet in Vermont can be a little can be a little patchy at times. Um, yeah, the affordability piece is is important. I think the permitting can be tricky in Vermont. Um, any way that we can you can streamline the permitting on a local level uh, for small communities can really help ease the cost. Um, yeah, and then just the the way that you can get creative with ADUs as well, um, bringing in a caregiver opening up your home to home share, um, renting out your home um, on a long-term basis. Uh, there's lots of different ways that you can help be able to supplement that. Or we've seen a lot of ADUs where the, 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 the adults will move into the ADU and bring their adult children into the main house who are raising their kids. Um, and, and there's a lot of different ways that you can make ADUs work. Um, construction costs are high in Vermont, um, regardless. So that's something that we are challenged with, and I'm sure it's similar in California. Um, but when you compare a new build with an ADU, um, it, there's a huge difference, and, and an ADU can be a very affordable option in that way. But um, I think tackle it, you know, and I know that Portland also, they've, they've done um, incentives and that's something that we're looking at exploring here, of ways that we could provide more incentives for ADUs. Um, I think that's a great way to go. Yeah, you know, is I want to underscore, this is a point that Mallory Batches has made, that uh, as you talk about the, the real benefit for the aging population of ADUs in rural Vermont, we're actually seeing that dynamic play out in smaller communities, um, all communities ac across the United States. That this is a real way to kind of provide not only affordable housing for new people coming in, but uh, increase the affordability for the folks living in the main house, as you were saying, bringing in their adult children. Um, I know in Santa Cruz, for example, you see homeowners moving into the ADU and then renting it out to, to, to new families. Um, 
I just lost a question. Danielle, do you have your question about? Yeah, I just put it in the, uh, I just put in the chat. In our ABCs of ADU's guide, which we did with uh, Eli Spivak of Orange Splot in Oregon, um, the average cost per square foot is about 100, between 150, not average, the range, 150 to 450 per square foot. Um, that's just my quick calculation of the ones that we feature here. And again, very regionally based uh, to Kelly's point, construction costs are going to vary widely. And those costs are coming down all the time too with more prefab construction as people know, I think. Um, Fred, how might you encourage CNU's audience, many of which are urban designers or planning practitioners to leverage the partnership with AARP in the way that you are able to do for the 13th Street project? Yeah, I think it kind of it's kind of similar to the, the questions we asked ourselves at AARP is what did we need to do? We, we, we needed to just reach out to folks outside of our organization, people that we would think about not working with in the past. Same thing I would encourage, uh, you know, uh, CNU members, reach out to AARP locally in your state. If you have an, uh, an office in your city, reach out to them. Reference all the things that uh, Danielle has talked about and that I've talked about, that Kelly's talked about, and say, hey, can we do this here in our city? And um, I think, uh, you know, be surprised by, uh, you know, by the response. So final, final question for the group. Uh, we're trying to move these and, and have them be a little bit more time. Uh, what opportunities have you seen for making inroads into turning the tide from uh, no in my backyard to yes in my backyard, right? It's as, you know, both Fred and Kelly have, have talked about this, but it's of reforming, you know, the issues we're coming into these issues around affordable housing, around ADUs, around increased densities. Um, so yes, engaging AARP, but can you talk a little bit more about the specific strategies of how you're changing it from no way to yes, please? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in and maybe start and, and partially because I wanna amplify the, the value of of a longer term policy framework or planning framework um, as represented by our age friendly network. I think one of the amazing things that we've been able to see through those three communities that I touched on very briefly is that when you, um, as a community, when you commit to wanting to be a place that people can age well in where older adults aren't forced to leave uh, because they can't afford to stay there or because they can't live the kind of lives they wanna live there, when a community commits to that future and then takes steps to, to, act, to proactively achieve that, that's a very different context um, for change than one that rigidly says, we got to figure out we don't want change. And I think what you see is a lot of the opposition, a lot of the NIMBY comes from fear of change, obviously. But, but when you're confronted with the reality that we as a country, as a community are changing and that our needs aren't, aren't addressing our, our communities aren't addressing current needs well, and they're certainly not going to address our future needs if we're on the same path. Once you create that kind of a, a forum for discussion and growth and evolution, I think it invites a very different kind of tenor um, of conversation around change. And, and again, to Fred's point, it's a table where diverse groups come together. It's a table where the home builders and the realtors are sitting with the bicycle and ped advocates, are sitting with the public works directors, are sitting with the area agencies on aging and all together figuring out what is it that we need to do differently to better serve the needs of older adults. Again, we start with that. We know that a lot of the solutions ultimately benefit people of all ages. And ultimately, that's really what we're trying to achieve here is, is places that are good for people of all ages. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and Lynn, if I, could, if I could add something, you know, um, this past year, uh, well, starting in late 2019 and then all through 2020, uh, a, a colleague of mine in, from Los Angeles uh, named Rocky Nazarians, we went around the state. We talked to developers, planners, elected officials, uh, equity groups, housing advocates, to ask them their opinion about uh, what AARP could do to, to assist with those kinds of issues. Because we, were, we heard loud and clear that there was this perception, true or not, that older adults are NIMBYs. They are the ones that show up at the city council meetings and are very vocal about housing you know, developments or housing projects that are on the council's agenda. So one of the things that came out of that is that we are going to create a volunteer corps of sorts uh, of local advocates who can speak in favor of housing and residential development at the local level. We already have that to a certain extent at the state level. So we have folks who can go into 
you know, the in, into Sacramento and 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 call and email and march the halls of the Capitol and that sort of thing. But we need to do that at the local level. So this is something brand new. We just we just launched a report about a you know a month and a half ago. Uh, but one one of our uh, 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 our recommendations, one of our plans coming out of the report, is to create this volunteer corps at the local level in support of housing. So, so, so sorry, so sorry about that. That's oh, um, I, I totally understand. That's hilarious. So, um, uh, Kelly, any final any final words before we before we close this out? Uh, no, thank you again, Lynn, for the opportunity. And I think Fred and Danielle answered that question wonderfully. <laughs> And hear the end of um, Fred's comment. So I want to thank everybody for joining us. I particularly want to thank our panelists, um, Kelly, Fred, and Danielle. And mostly, I want to thank AARP in general for being such an incredible partner, not only to CNU and our chapters and to our members, but to the movement as a whole. Like having a partner like CNU just, or like AARP moving together, it just it really gives me hope that that we're we're turning the, we're turning the tide. So, want to remind everyone again to register for on the park bench next week. Well, we'll where we will hear from Mindy Fullolove and Kennedy Smith, and don't forget to register for the Congress. So, um, finally, we will post the recording of this on CNU's website within 24 hours, and AARP will cross promote it as well. So. Thank you, everyone, for participating, and thank you again to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, all.